Jesus, thank you for being in this place today, Lord. We thank you that we can come and wait on you, Lord. And so we stand today, Lord, and we wait on you, Lord. We will not be shaken in this place, Lord. We will not be moved in this place, Lord. We'll wait on you today, Lord. Our hope is in you today, Lord. You'll come, Lord. You'll come if we'll seek you, Lord, with our full hearts, Lord. If we'll cling to you, Lord, you will come. You'll inhabit our praises, Lord. You'll fill our lives, Lord. You'll revive and restore and refresh and heal. And we pray, Lord, that you would do that here and that you would do that now for your glory and in your name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, come right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you in advance, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We ask you in the name of Jesus to give us ears to hear, Lord. Prepare our hearts for this message, Lord. Let us take it in. Let's truly transform by your power, change, set apart for a purpose for your glory, Heavenly Father. We welcome you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Give somebody a hug, would you? Give them a hug. Tell them Jesus loves them because they might not know. You might be surprised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
Hey, thanks for coming to church today. You know, you had, you had an excuse today with the whole clock thing. Like, oh, sorry, I couldn't come to church because of my clock. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but for some reason, people feel like they need to tell me when they don't come to church. You know why? <laughs> and I always go, yeah, right. Uh, but I don't say it out loud, Curtis. <laughs> it's just inside. <laughs> hey, we're going to let you give. The guys are going to come forward. We're going to let you worship tangibly. You know, money's, uh, money's an issue, isn't it? Why is money such an issue? I think it's because it, it, um, it, it, it's because it so easily gets entangled in our hearts or our hearts get entangled in money. You know, Jesus spoke more about money than heaven and hell combined because he spoke about what he knew was a risk, just like you do with your children. You, you discern what's a risk in their life, and then you teach them about it. And Jesus taught us a lot about money. And, and uh, you know, we as Christians, you know, we stop all the big sins, right? But what we find is it, is it, it takes a long time after that for a Christian to release the hold that money has on them. And I think it maybe is a bit of a cultural thing, but I think it's more of a flesh thing, a heart thing. I want you guys to know that this world, this isn't it. This world is a vapor, right? We may see Jesus before we see the sunset today. Right? <laughs> that, that's how fleeting this world is. And everything we do for Jesus will last. It will remain. It goes ahead of us into eternity. It's part of what will be our eternity. And the Bible is very clear. It matters. It matters. And so we want to be part of eternity. We want our hearts set on eternity. And, and the truth is, you know, though, though we hate it when pre preachers talk about money, the truth is money has a lot to do with where your heart is. So let's send our hearts to heaven. Lord Jesus, you don't need our money. But Lord, it's always been a challenge from you for us to discern lordship in our lives with money. And so, Lord, today we say again, afresh and anew, you are Lord, not mammon, not the things of this world, not our flesh, Lord, not our own desires, but you, Jesus, our Lord. And we back that up with how we live. We back that up with the choices we make. We back that up with the priorities in our life. And we back that up with our giving, Lord, to say, Lord, I'm not just giving you lip service. I want to be part of your kingdom work. I want to be part of something eternal. I want my treasures to go before me into eternity so that my heart will chase after them there. I want to look forward to being in eternity with you, Lord. And I want to invest in that life. Lord, as we give today, would you encourage our hearts Lord, that as we give, Lord, we leave this temporal and fleeting place and we take part of an eternal and awesome work. Lord, you've already brought salvation in this room this morning. Lives have already been changed for eternity here today. Lord, we want to be part of that. We want to give to that end. Lord, we want to give cheerfully, excitedly, expectantly. We thank you for allowing us to be part of your work, Lord. We pray you would encourage us as we give. In your name, for your glory, Jesus. Amen.
sing a race and save the rest like me. I Was blind, but now I see. was grace that taught my heart, and grace my fears relieved. How precious that. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life. Father, we thank you 
We thank you right now, Lord. The message is going to go forth today. I just pray, Lord, that we could take root, Lord, in that. That that bitter root of unforgiveness would be ripped out of us, Lord. The things that are holding us back of unforgiveness, they would be cast away in Jesus' name, Lord. I pray that you would prepare the hearts right now, Lord. All distractions be set aside. Give us your hear, ears excuse me, to hear from you right now, Lord. I just pray that you would prepare our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. So we had another work day. In it rained. We had 22 volunteers. Praise the Lord. That was a record. We had painting going on. We were doing the ceiling over here in the building. Uh, go ahead. You can roll it. Praise the Lord. So a pepper tree fell, blew down two years ago, and uh, we got it out. We're getting ready. We're excited. We're passionate. Easter's, Easter's coming. We got two more, uh, two more available Saturdays. We pray in advance for Easter and the weather. Keep that in prayer. It's going to be 80 degrees. It'll be sunny. No rain in Jesus' name. Why not? Why can't we? You know, come on. Amen. Amen. So we had a wonderful work day. We got a couple more. Um, we love it that you guys come out and you share your heart. There's testimony after testimony. I see you guys serving, and I love it. You're working with me. And we're working for the Lord. Look at that. You know, praise the Lord. Look at how sweet she is. I love that lady. She's always willing, whatever. You know, and I just ask her, and she's here. No worries. And this guy, that's my, that's my guy right there. We got to pray for that guy. That guy's being transformed up at Bible college, man. He set, a, he set on fire. I was working with him yesterday, and he's just singing. I took him to Home Depot. He's singing. He's singing the Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I'm like, yes, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. The lady's like looking at him. I'm like, yeah, that's my guy. So praise the Lord. So uh, Lisa's coming up. Um, if you guys have time next Saturday, um, come. Come volunteer. Spend some time. I'll make some hot dogs. We'll pray while we'll fellowship. We'll get some stuff done. You want to come? You can come. Pete said you're coming. Pete said you're coming. Already be here. You already be here. So we're going to eat all the leftovers. Potluck. Amen. Leftovers. Maybe. All right. Bless you guys. Thank you. Have you eaten with the women? There's... No, I'm teasing. Um, so I just want to talk to you guys again about Easter. Um, myself and or Paula will be standing outside. Um, a lot of you are already on the list for Easter, for volunteering for different things. Um, we still need a lot of help. So uh, come on out and uh, sign your name where you think um, you would be the most helpful, and then we'll probably move you. <laughs> no, I'm teasing, but it'll be great. You know, so just get excited to serve one another and serve the Lord and just prepare your hearts for Easter as we prepare this property. And then the second thing I want to talk to you about is our women's um, potluck. It is this Saturday, 9 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Um, and I wanted to focus on the Casa, Casa del Pastor. The women there are in need of socks, ankle socks. Um, so come and talk to us and we'll explain it to you. But we're doing donations that Saturday. So come and bring as many socks as you want. The more, the better for them. And we're really looking forward to it. So yeah, come out and do some fellowship and worship with Des and a short little message and eat. And then, and then stick around and work after that. No, no, the work will be over by the time the women are done eating. Uh, so, come, well, I, you know, it takes a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Lots, uh, lots going on for, for Easter. Uh, we praise the Lord for, uh, for everything that God's going to do here that day. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, I, I, I don't know if we're, if we're really making it clear or not, but we're feeding everybody that day. So, uh, so come help us uh, feed the community. Uh, I heard there was another pancake breakfast going on that day. Uh, not the church, but another group. Um, I'm not sure about that. But uh, anyway, the community ought to be really well fed that day. Uh, so uh, come out and be part of uh, blessing the community. Make sure you're part of the serving team for that. Uh, youth is leaving. We, I think we had, I think we had like some kind of a record group last week with the youth. Twenty, huh? Twenty, yeah. Twenty, you don't know. Yeah, a lot. So see you guys later. 
We should, we should make them breakfast. That's what we should do is we should cook the youth breakfast. Daryl could do that. 20 what? 23? 20, she has 20 burritos today? I, went, I don't want any 40-year-olds going right now. All right? Come on. Or 30-year-olds. Uh, but I do hope she saves me one. Um, no, no, I don't. I do, actually, but she won't. Uh, All right, I got a special message for you guys today. Uh, it's a message some of you have heard, and uh, just just hold on because you need to hear it again. So I'll just uh, I'll just say that on behalf of the Lord. If you'll open your Bibles, I'll give you the title of the message. Title of the message today: Divine Forgiveness, and we're going to say 2018 to distinguish it from. All the other times I've taught this message. First time I taught this subject in in this scripture uh, was in 2000. uh, And uh, and it's a message that we need to hear again. And for some reason, you can decide later. For some reason, we need to hear it today. Matthew chapter 18, the incredible parable there of the unforgiving servant from verse 21 to verse 35. Listen, in the Bible... Mercy, mercy is compassion in action towards someone who doesn't deserve it. Mercy in the Bible is compassion in action towards someone who doesn't deserve it. 2 Corinthians 1.3 calls God the father of mercies and the God of all comfort and all that Jesus has done for us, all that he's done to save us, to give us new life, to make an eternal home for us, has all come from his mercy, his compassion and action towards those who don't deserve it in the most sacrificial way possible. The Lord of glory acted in eternal compassion toward those who did not and who could not and will never deserve his mercy, ever. That's us. God's mercy is compassion in action toward those who don't deserve it. And the Bible's level of mercy that leads to divine forgiveness, that's where we're going today, God's mercy that leads to divine forgiveness is not something that we can work up ourselves. This is not something that we figure out, that we reason or use logic for. The only way we can have this level of mercy that leads to divine forgiveness is through the life of Jesus Christ inside of us. It is our only hope. We have none without him. It's Christ living in us. And it's Christ forgiving through us that allows us to live in divine forgiveness. How important is it? How important is it for us to live in this level of divine mercy, this compassion and action to those who don't deserve it? Well, here's a clue. James 2 verse 13 says, there will be no mercy. No mercy for you. Next. Thank you. No more Seinfeld reruns, babe. There will be no mercy. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Jesus himself in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 7 said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy. In Matthew chapter 18, this mercy we call divine forgiveness. It is forgiving that person in our lives who doesn't deserve forgiving. We'll see today that God calls us to this divine forgiveness. Please hear me. God calls us to this divine forgiveness for our own good. Not really so much for that person's good, but for our own good, to free us from the torture of unforgiveness. God has made a way to save you from the self-inflicted torture of unforgiveness and the sins that come with it. 
bitterness, resentment, anger, wrath, malice, all those things that come as unforgiveness grows deeper and darker in our hearts. And so by the Lord offering us his own divine forgiveness, we can receive it personally, and by him being that divine forgiveness in us, in us we can give it to others who don't deserve it just like we don't. Can you handle a message on divine forgiveness today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, please, even now, Lord, begin to bring up, as we pray, Lord, begin to bring up by your Holy Spirit that person, that situation, that circumstance, that you would call us, Lord, to a higher calling in, that you would call us to divine forgiveness, to divine mercy, Lord, we pray that our hearts would be healed of unforgiveness and all of the destructive, torturing sins that come with it, that our hearts would be healed and made new today, that we would receive your mercy and that we would embrace it to the extent that we are able to give it out for healing, Lord, for healing. We pray you'd speak it to us today for your glory, and in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Unforgiveness and the sins that come from it put us in bondage. They put us in a prison. They bring destruction into a Christian's life. And God has given us his mercy in order to free us from the torture that that brings in our life. So let me just say this before we begin. I know, and I always know, that there are people in the room that have experienced just really significant trauma, really, really, really difficult stuff, very traumatic, very uh, damaging potentially if it wasn't for the healing of the Lord. I understand that. I really do. And I'm not saying that divine forgiveness is easy. I'm not saying it's instantaneous. I'm saying that God desires to free you from the destruction and the torture of holding on to unforgiveness in that situation. So as we continue again, I just pray that you would bring up in your mind, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to, for me, you know, it's like he puts a face in front of me. I'm like, ah, let me look around now. <laughs> yeah. And he puts it back up. I'm like, ah. What is it for you? How does the Holy Spirit speak to you and show you the person or the situation or the circumstance that he wants to directly deal with you on? Would you take a minute and just listen? Just listen for him. And then have the courage to say, yes, Lord, I get it. I got that. I have the picture. I have the person. I have the situation. I wanna show you three supernatural, supernatural transforming steps to experiencing divine forgiveness in your life, all of which come from Matthew 18, from this parable. I'll put them on the wall. Three supernatural steps to divine forgiveness. First, we must receive God's mercy. We must receive it positionally so that we can be saved, though we don't deserve it. And we must receive it in the sense of embracing it, of owning it, of allowing our lives to be filled and controlled by it. And then we must make the comparison. We must make the comparison. This is what crushes our pride and leads to brokenness so that we can take step number three, which is giving out God's mercy that he has poured into our lives. Three supernatural transforming steps that will enable you to walk in divine forgiveness and will save you from the continual hardening of your heart in unforgiveness, which leads to torture, and ultimately destruction of a Christian's life. Matthew 18, Jesus had just finished a section of how to correctly correct a believer. And you've probably heard that section. You've probably heard it uh, misused. 
Uh, but that's the section right before the one, the parable we're jumping into today. I'm using the ESV today. Uh, so if you have an ESV, you'll be glad. If you have an NLT, you'll be able to follow easily. In the ESV, the section before the parable is titled, If Your Brother Sins Against You. And so the disciples are coming out of this teaching about how to deal with a brother who has sinned against you. And we pick it up in Matthew 18, Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter, of course, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And certainly that sounds reasonable, seven times. There's uh, many of us who wouldn't consider forgiving someone uh, any more than seven times. But from Peter, just knowing Peter, we kind of sense there's some pride in there. Like, Lord, I would even forgive seven times, uh, you know, the number of perfection. So Peter, uh, we love him because uh, two things, he was never afraid to open his mouth and he was never afraid to put his foot in it. So uh, we love Peter for that. We relate to him. And so Jesus corrects him here in Matthew 18, verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. If you're reading the NLT, it says 70 times seven, because the Greek there can be translated either way, either 77 times or 70 times seven. Whether it's 77 or 70 times seven, everyone is in agreement that Jesus is saying that we are called to forgive an unlimited amount of time, an unlimited amount of times an unlimited amount of times. And then Jesus tells us a parable to help us understand how high a priority heaven puts on us living in divine forgiveness and in divine mercy. That's the purpose of the parable. Again, you'll see the three steps receiving God's mercy, making the comparison, and then giving out God's mercy that he has given us. As we read through the parable, you'll see each of the steps starting in verse 23. Therefore, Jesus says, therefore, to connect the parable to the previous teachings. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared. This is a crucial opening uh, phrase to many of the parables. It's saying, look, you can understand the kingdom of heaven by understanding this parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So let's set the stage correctly, just in case you uh, might have it backwards. The king is God, right? Not you. The king is God. The servant who owes the debt is you. So the king's God, the master's God, the servant who owes the 10,000 talents is you. And again, verse 23 says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to this situation. You owe God a debt. You owe God a debt of 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents is an absolutely unrepayable amount. If you're reading in ESV, in the footnote, it says 20 years wages in your footnote. But if you're reading the NLT, check the footnote. The NLT says 375 tons of silver. That's a lot of silver. <laughs> 375 tons of silver. This is an unimaginable, unrepayable debt that you owe to the king of heaven. Matthew 18, verse 25, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, that's sold as a slave, with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. 
This was the normal and customary response at that time to this type of debt. In fact, it was the correct and even you would say the righteous response when a debt like this could not be paid. The the debtor and his family would be sold as slaves along with everything they have to try to make a dent in the debt they owe. In the same way, listen, in the same way, God's wrath of judgment is the correct and righteous response to the debt you owe. It's the right response. Judgment for sin. Matthew 18, 26, continuing. So the servant, that's you, fell on his knees, imploring him, God, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. You think so, really? I don't think so. I'll pay you 20 years wages, 375 tons of silver. I'll pay you. This servant could never pay this unrepayable debt. But sometimes that's us to God. God, I'll do this for you. I'll do that for you. I'll... I'll make it right for you. No, no, you can't. You can't. It's an unrepayable debt. You have no hope of getting back to zero with God. And so the master responds in Matthew 18, verse 27, and out of pity, out of pity for him, mark that word, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. The master, the king of heaven, had pity on you. And he released you and completely forgave the debt. Most of the translations replace this word pity with the word compassion. Most of them writing, the master was moved with compassion. Here's what Harper's Bible Dictionary says about this word pity or compassion. It describes a person who shows significant kindness to someone who does not deserve it and cannot repay it. That's God's compassion, that's God's mercy, that's his pity that he shows on us. He shows us significant kindness when we don't deserve it and we cannot repay it. That's step one, we must receive God's mercy. We can't earn it, we can't deserve it, we can't try harder. We are hopeless and helpless, and we receive his mercy, his kindness, when we can't deserve it. And we are forgiven, and we're released from a debt that we could not pay. That's what God's done for us. If you are saved today by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, then God has not given you what you deserve. Instead, he's given you mercy and he's released you, and he's forgiven you for an unrepayable debt. Step number one, we must receive God's mercy. We must receive it both positionally so that we can be forgiven, but we must receive it in the sense of embracing it, of bringing it into our lives, of acknowledging that this is the nature of God in my life. Now, We move to you and your dealings with that person who has wronged you. Step number two, we must make the comparison. Matthew 18, verse 28a, the first half. But when that same servant went out, that's you, you went out, you went on purpose. When that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants. He went looking and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. You went out looking for someone after you were forgiven an unrepayable debt, and you found someone who owed you a hundred denarii. It's three months' wages at the very most. Now, let me do the math for you. In the previous verse, you were forgiven 1,040 months' wages. At the very least, using the 20-year guess, you were forgiven 1,000 months' wages, and you went looking for someone who owed you 330 times less 
than what you have just been forgiven for. Let's read the verse again. In the second half, we see what you do when you find that person who has wronged you. Matthew 18, verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe me. Just like God had done to him. It doesn't seem right, does it? Jesus is comparing how much God has forgiven us of with how much we are willing to forgive others of. Do you see it? How are we doing? How are we doing making the comparison? Do we? Do we even make the comparison? Do we say, Lord, as much as I've been forgiven, should that impact how much I forgive? As freely forgiven Christians, how are we doing in freely forgiving others in our lives? It's the point of the parable. Is there a chance that we're actually, instead of forgiving, that we're actually <laughs> looking for that person and putting them in a chokehold, even either physically or, or mentally, emotionally, putting them in some sort of prison, even if we put them in prison in our own minds. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not the only one that does this, where, where you know, it's all in your mind, man, and that's where it's all, it all starts up there, and, and you're, you're angry at that person, and, and you, you're responding to them angrily, and you have them in prison, and they're paying in your mind, but, but they're not paying in your, in your mind, you're paying in your mind, and we refuse to forgive them. In fact, they don't deserve to be forgiven. We're right putting them in prison. And so we track them down, either physically or, or even emotionally or mentally, and we put them in a chokehold, and then they say to us exactly what we just said to God. In Matthew 18, verse 29, so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, that's you, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he, you, refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. The servant's servant asks, pleads for the same mercy that you just received from God. But the servant who had been forgiven so much refuses to forgive his fellow servant of comparatively so little. Instead, he throws that servant into prison to make him pay. They deserve to pay. They do deserve to pay. But be careful asking God for everyone to get what they deserve. Right? For us, the most dangerous prison we can put people in is a prison in our own minds. They've wronged us, and we're going to make them pay. It's only right that they pay. What happens is we end up trading places with them because they don't even know we have them in prison in our minds. They don't even know we're torturing them in their minds. And so we trade places with them and who ends up being in bondage and tortured? Us. Because of our unforgiveness. I think verse 31 is possibly the saddest verse in the entire parable. Because in verse 31, I always imagine the angels going to Jesus and saying, Lord, we got something we want to talk to you about. Matthew 18, verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Can you see the angels going in disbelief? to the Lord and saying, Lord, 
it cost you so much to forgive that person. We didn't understand it when you did it. And you offered them your forgiveness so freely. And then they went out and hunted down someone who owed them so much less than they owed you, and they put him in a chokehold and threw him in prison to make him pay. Lord, it doesn't seem right, does it? And Jesus, I can imagine, says, I'll be right back. I have a servant to talk to. Matthew 18, verse 32, this servant who had been previously forgiven of his unrepayable debt and set free, verse 32, then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? That's making the comparison. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? The NLT says here in verse 33, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as? This word is one Greek word, but um, usually translated as just as, just as I had mercy on you. It's an important phrase or even the single word as because the word means in the same way. The word means to the same extent. Jesus is saying, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant in the same way and to the same extent as I had mercy on you? Shouldn't we be showing mercy in the same way and to the same extent as we have been shown mercy by the Lord? We must make the comparison, and we seldom do. We seldom make the connection that as the Lord has forgiven us that we are called to forgive in the same way even to the same extent. Again, I know sometimes it seems impossible. The pain is so deep and the, the event's so traumatic. I understand. I really, really do. Sometimes even the thought of it is unimaginable. But what if I told you that Jesus is commanding you to forgive for your good, not that other person? What if I told you he's commanding you to forgive to keep you from being tortured by your unforgiveness? What if I told you that Jesus is trying to save you from all of the sins that come from unforgiveness, the anger and the bitterness and the resentment and the wrath and the malice and all the darkness that comes? So regarding this servant who refused to forgive in the same way he'd been forgiven, we read in Matthew 18, verse 34, and in anger, speaking of Jesus, speaking of the master, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. The ESV translate the, translates the word jailers, but if you look in the footnotes, if you have an ESV, it says torturers. And the NLT just writes it as it is. And the NLT, Matthew 18, 34 says, then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. What do you mean to be tortured? This servant has already been forgiven of his unrepayable debt he owed to God. And now he's being sent to prison to be tortured? Doesn't that seem a little too much? Doesn't it seem to be overreacting? Certainly, God would not do that to me. Certainly, God would not do that if I just, I mean, it's right. What that person did was wrong. God's not going to judge me for not forgiving him. 
I'm right to not forgive. <laughs> Jesus on the main line. <laughs> Tell him what you want. Listen, all I can do is read the next verse to you. Okay? All I can do is read the next verse, Matthew 18, 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. What does that mean? Well, let me read it again for you. So also means that's what? That's what my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Seriously. Jesus wouldn't do that to me. I mean, Lord, remember how the guy with the big teeth said you had my best life ready for me? That you were gonna do everything I needed and provide everything I wanted and make me happy at all times? What about that part? What about the Lord part? Are you saying I'll be tortured if I refuse to forgive in the same way that you've forgiven me? Please hear me. Please, please hear me. Hardened unforgiveness becomes mental and emotional torture. A hardened heart of unforgiveness becomes permanent mental and emotional torture. And I have seen it last well, the, the one situation that comes to mind, you know, in my own family, I've seen it last for 50 years. Hardened unforgiveness becomes mental and emotional torture. We think we're all in control. We think that our anger and our wrath and our unforgiveness gives us a level of control. It doesn't. Our unforgiveness is actually in control. And our unforgiveness will place us in that prison that we think we put the other person in, and we will be the ones suffering the torture. Unforgiveness will become a ruthless torturer in your life. And you have the Lord's word on it. That's serious. Fortunately, it's the end of the parable, but it's not the end of the story. Fortunately, God never just gives us a command and then expects us to do it on our own strength or in our own strength. He never leaves us with just a command like we could accomplish this level of divine forgiveness or mercy on our own. Here's what happens is his life becomes our life. His life, the all-forgiving, all-merciful God takes over our life and his life in us forgives for us. We can't, we can't work this up. We don't have this in us. The love of God, Romans 5, 5 says, is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Up until that point, you ain't got any. You have none. But the Lord has said to you that he will come into your life and if you will surrender to him, then he living inside you will become divine forgiveness through you and for you. It, sometimes it seems, um, you know, maybe sometimes flippant or trite when, when people say, oh no, that's the Lord. Oh no, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. Listen, when you've got something that is really tormenting you and you receive the miracle of divine forgiveness, it is the Lord. <laughs> okay. It is the Lord. And when he does that, it's a miracle that happens in your life and you're transformed forever by it. And you become a testimony for the Lord, which is what we're supposed to be. Jesus says, I myself will be your divine forgiveness in your place. All you have to do is crucify your own life, crucify your own flesh, put off your own nature and receive my nature, and I will do it in you and through you. 
Your only job is to let me, to walk in the new life that I've given you of divine forgiveness. Step three is we must give out the mercy that God has poured into our lives. So we receive God's mercy, we make the comparison, which is just to break our pride, and then in our brokenness we understand we've been forgiven so much, we must forgive so much. Right? And then Jesus in us, the divine nature of God replaces our sin nature, and we allow the mercy that is the nature of Jesus Christ to be, to be delivered out of us to someone who doesn't deserve it. We give divine forgiveness. We give divine forgiveness from the new life of Jesus Christ that is rising up in us. Listen, God calls us to forgive in the same way that we've been forgiven. The just as, it means, it means to the same extent, in the same way. Colossians 3.13 says, as, again, it's just as, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. But the just as means in the same way, to the same extent. Lord, how can I forgive in the same way and to the same extent as you've forgiven me? You can't. But if Jesus Christ in you is forgiving, then he's forgiving in the same way and to the same extent that he forgave you because it's the same divine person. It's not you, it's him. <laughs> For once, you can say, you know, it's not me, it's him. Uh, li <laughs> Listen, it's the life of Christ in you that forgives through you. Your job is to just get the life of Christ in you. And you can't do that without crucifying your own life. It's not something we do. It's something that he does in us. We have to give up our right to say that we've been wrong. We have to give up our right to not be wrong. How do we look at Jesus and say, I have no right to be wrong? Jesus is like, what, you think I did? We have to give up the right to hold on to the cancer of unforgiveness, to, to take that fire into our bosom. We have to give over to God the things we can't fix. We have to give over to God the things we can't control. And we've got to replace those things with God's mercy. And that mercy leads to divine forgiveness. And when it does, it's a miracle. Can I say please again, I'm not making light of this. I have been in tremendously like unimaginable situations with people where I just say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how I could forgive that person. But I know my God. I know how big my God is. I know what my God's able to do. And yeah, I can't put myself in that situation humanly, but I know that God can. And what he says is true. And he's merciful enough to give you the mercy to free you from the, the torture of your own unforgiveness. That's how merciful our God is. If you belong to Jesus Christ today, he is transforming you from glory to glory. Wherever you're at now, he wants to move you to the next level of holiness, to the next level of transformation from glory to glory into his image. That's what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. It says, and the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him. He makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. That's my prayer for you. That's my request. That's my challenge is would you pray, Lord Jesus, make me more like you. I willingly crucify my own nature, my own will, myself. And as I do, Lord, would you take over? 
Would you pour your life into me to such an extent that your life in me can forgive what I can't forgive? Would you trust him to do that? It's a faith thing. We you trust that Jesus Christ can do that great a miracle in your life? And would you continue to cry out to him until he does? Would you continue to ask and seek and knock, knowing that you're being transformed from glory to glory into his image? For that person specifically, for that situation specifically, until you're transformed into that image and you experience this divine forgiveness. God wants to free you from the bondage of unforgiveness, from the torturing prison of unforgiveness and all the sin that comes with it. He wants to renew you and restore you and transform you. He wants to give you the gift of divine forgiveness and free you from this. You have to let him. You have to join him in what he's doing. Would you do that? Let's pray. Lord, right now, God, we just, need to, we just need to step into that right now, Lord. We can go through our whole lives playing like everything's good, like we don't have that blackness, that hard, black heart of unforgiveness. But Lord, you promised that when we seek you, we will find you, and that you would take out that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, that, that Lord, we would be dead with you, that our nature, our old man would be rendered inoperative, and that we would be raised to walk in newness of life with you. And Lord, this matter is a litmus test matter. Would you flood us right now with your Holy Spirit to bring us to the point of receiving your mercy and giving out your divine forgiveness? As we wrap up, I just want you to pray right now. That person, that situation, that trauma, that experience, would you just have the courage to just put it up to the Lord, just raise it up or raise that person up and say, Jesus, I need you to be free of the bondage that this has created in my life. I need to be free of the unforgiveness, Lord, that I am imprisoned by. Would you come like a flood? And bring your mercy to replace my unforgiveness. Would you deal with me on this right now, Jesus, please? The worship team's going to play, and I'm going to have some prayer counselors come up front. And if you would just step out even into the aisle if you would just make yourself known, they'll reach you and they'll pray with you. If you would come up, then praise the Lord. Just come up to them and say, pray for me. It's no counseling session. They won't ask you what your situation is. They'll just lay your, their hand on you and pray that the Holy Spirit would wash over you. That you would experience a divine and miraculous healing the bitterness that's in your heart. Would you please not let your mind wander? Please deal specifically with the Lord on this matter that he's been talking to you about as we sing. You can make your way up. Honestly, if you just stand up and move to one of the aisles, one of the counselors will come to you.
would you take this opportunity to make a commitment, to take a stand and say, Lord, this is an area I need healing in. This is an area I need to be free of, Lord. He is chasing you because he loves you. is reckless for you. You have been so, so good. He will chase you wherever you go. He will chase you down. Before I took a breath, you breathe your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love for us. Just stand with us and sing. But your love is overwhelming, Lord. Your love is overwhelming. Stand with us, would you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you would just step out from where you're at, one of these counselors will come and pray for you. Take a stand right now and say, I need this. I need this healing in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we know, Lord, that you want to tear this out of us because of your love for us, Lord, that you want to heal this in us for our good, Lord. And we know, God, that there's nothing that can stop you, Lord, from reaching us with your love, Lord. And so today we stop covering up and denying and justifying and rationalizing our sin of unforgiveness. Instead, we recognize it as a sin and say, Lord, please take it from me. Please heal me from it, Lord. Please replace my hard heart with your heart of mercy and compassion and forgiveness, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you need some prayer, step up here, get some prayer. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you've been so good to us, Lord. How can we keep this from you? your love knows no bounds. Thank you, Jesus. up here get some prayer come on come on there's still time thank you Jesus wash through this room Lord bring healing bring forgiveness Lord bring new life into this room God Lord do a miraculous work in us Lord to restore us God to use us, Lord, to work through us, God. 
radically save us and radically transform us, we pray, Lord. Stop you, Lord, from reaching us. No wall you won't tear down. Lie you won't tear down. Come and after me. Lord, you're coming for us on this one. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountains you won't Chase us, Lord. Chase us down. Reach our hearts on this matter, Lord. No wall you won't tear down. Lie you won't tear down. Transform us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. In Jesus' name. Nothing, Lord. There's nothing that will stop your love, Lord. Pour it out on us. Lord, meet us right here, God, and transform us. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Save us from ourselves. That's right, that's right, that's right. Praise your mighty name, Lord. Lord, we pray healing, healing over our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your mighty name. Holy is your name in this place, Lord. Would you right now make a commitment to the Lord before we stop? Would you make a commitment? Would you say, Lord, I, you finish. I surrender. I surrender. I confess. I repent. I repent, Lord, from the anger, from the, the pride that's keeping me thinking I'm right. I repent, Lord. God, break me down so that you can save me, Lord. Lord, I forgive. I forgive. I forgive that person. I forgive you, Lord. I blamed you for that situation, Lord, for that event. And Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. Sorry, Lord. There's nothing that will stop God from getting to you. Give in. He's coming for you. He's coming for you. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing will stop, Lord. You're coming to save us, Lord, and you're not going to give up. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord.
Lord, we stand before you just as we are, Lord. With all that you've changed and all that you still desire to change in us, Lord, right where we're at, we stand in your grace. We stand in your mercy, Lord. And we pray as you fill us, Lord, that we would give your mercy out to those around us. And through it, Lord, continue to transform us into your image and save us from the torture of unforgiveness. We thank you for doing it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your glory in our lives and in your name, amen.